Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Hey, welcome to this family Bible study hour. Know what? We're going to kick around the, the latter days a little bit in this particular lecture following the latter rain that we covered in the last lecture. And certainly we ask a word of wisdom from our Father that He enlighten us on some of these terms that we find scattered throughout God's Word which mean a great deal more than oftentimes is written. We, uh, concerning the latter days, never confuse it with the last day. The last day has to do with exactly that, Christ's return, what will uh, take place on that day. But the latter days have to do, let's say basically with the, the years and days we're in the events that are prophesied to happen within those latter days, let's say happen in one generation, such as the generation of the fig tree. That, in other words, it is the events and the prophecies that come to pass as those events consummate the end of this age. In other words, many of the seals and happen long before the day that Christ returns. So in a sense, you could say all but the seventh seal and up to the fifth happen in the latter days. Naturally, the, the fifth is well marked in as much as that's when Antichrist is kicked from heaven. So, and things happen pretty fast after that as far as the remaining two um, seals. So the latter days are very important. Because we know that the fig tree, the shoot, was set out in the year of our Lord, 1948, when, as according to Jeremiah chapter 24, that both the good and the bad figs, the shoots were set in Jerusalem. And that generation, now it's according to how long you want to say a generation is. There's a 40-year generation, a 70, 72-year generation, a 120-year generation. But be that as it may, when you hear of the latter days, then know that you're talking about the events that consummate the very end of this age. When you see those prophecies come to pass, you better know that um, the false Messiah is not too far away. We could even say the true Messiah at his second advent is not too far away. So the latter day prophecies definitely should find interest in your mind and heart as a servant of the living God. Now, where do we want to start? Well, as, as we did in the last lecture, let's start back in the Old Testament for as we learned in the fifth chapter of James, and you'll learn the same thing from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10. All these things happened as examples to us, whereby we could know what was transpiring at that time. I'm, gonna, I'm going to take old Balak to start out with, you know, um, and, um, and, uh, and Balaam. You know what Balaam? Balaam was a servant of God, and he was what some would call a fair servant. So this prophecy kind of has a little bit to do with what's supposed to be taught in those latter days by those teachers or priests that reign in that particular time with um, uh, certainly with um, Balaam being the example that will be set forth here in this or used as your example. Whatever you do, be very careful of Balaam's. Balaam was a fair priest. He always went to God. God told him, yeah, you can go over there if they do a certain thing. Well, they didn't do it, but boy, old Balaam, early the next morning before the sun comes up, he's already saddled his ass and he's on the road. I mean, he, 
Why? He wanted the money. It's that pure and simple. He was willing to even disobey God. He didn't exactly disobey. Well, yeah, he did. But he fudged in as much as God gave him the approval if. He just didn't wait for the if. All right. In his mind, he was clear. God had said, go if. He just forgot to wait for the if. God didn't like it. God doesn't like that in his teachers or those that are responsible for seeing that the God's children are fed the proper information at the proper time. It's very important to him. And he comes down on their case when they do not follow his instructions. So, to open into the latter days, let's, let's pick it up. Turn to Numbers chapter 24, if you will. Way back in the Old Testament, the book of Numbers. And um, we find there uh, by, in the Pentateuch by Moses in the 14th verse. We're going to pick it up there. You can go ahead and read the story of Balaam if you choose. But as we get underway with that word of wisdom in our mind, let's begin with verse 14 and let's see what our Father has to say. And now behold, I go unto my people... Come therefore, and I will advise thee what this people shall do to thy people in the latter days. So you have an example set forth, and you're about to receive a prophecy that would cover many years and, and especially be telescoped to the latter days, this generation. Verse 15, And he took up his parable, and he said, Balaam, the son of Beor, hath said, and the man whose eyes are open hath said, uh, there, this is, I find a little bit of humor in this in as much as God caused Balaam's ass to speak to him on the road that day to turn him around. Balaam couldn't see the angel of God, which is to say God in front of him, but the ass could. And the ass jumped over against a wall and kind of hurt old Balaam's foot and he began to jump out the ass's case. And the ass says, as good as I've been to you all these years, always faithful to carry you everywhere you go. And here's the angel of the Lord standing in front of us. And by about that time, Balaam began to wake up and come to the party. And God was showing Balaam that even a dumb ass can see God when man, oftentimes if he gets his mind on money or disobeying, disobedience to Almighty God, he can be blind. God will see to it that he's blind. But here he says his eyes are opened. 16. He has said which heard the words of God and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty falling into a trance but having his eyes open. In other words, he was shown a vision from Almighty God and at least Balaam was intelligent enough to know that when the Lord God speaks, it had better be online. Also, Balaam had another problem. He had the knowledge, but he kind of misused it a little bit. Knowledge is not worth anything to you if you do not exercise what those things that knowledge leads you to do for your own benefit or especially for the benefit of the people. All right? Knowledge is worthless if, you don't, if you're not a can-do type person that puts it to work. All right, verse 17. This being the vision, I shall see him, but not now. We're talking about Messiah here, Jesus Christ at the first advent. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob. And a scepter shall rise out of Israel. In other words, the scepter is the king's scepter. And Christ would be that king of kings and lord of lords. Looking forward now even to the second advent. And shall smite the corners. Or better translated, all corners. All four of them. Of Moab. And destroy all the children of Seth. Now, I have to stop there, and we've got to correct that, all right? Let's, let's have a little Bible lesson within a Bible lesson. So put a little print here, and we'll print it at the end. But you know that God would not destroy all the children of Seth, 
all right, that just won't fly. So what is it saying? Let's take a little example. What does the word Moses mean? It means drawn from the water or to draw from the water, all right? Now, uh, one way of doing this to make the point, I could say to you, here, I dropped this in the water. Will you Moses it? What would you think? Would you Moses it? What are you talking about? Well, you see, someone would have taken a personal name, or I would have taken a personal name, and inserted it in a sentence rather than giving the full translation of the name, which means drawn from the water. In other words, I drop my hat, would you draw it from the water? Well, now that's what you have here with Seth. It is not a personal name. It is not a personal noun. It is the word Seth, so what you really must know is what does Seth mean in the Hebrew tongue, whereby you can understand which children we're talking about, and it happens to be confusion or tumult. All right? We say in the South, tumult, all right? Well, it's tumult. The children that cause the trouble. All right, there you go. Not Seth. Someone used the name Seth simply because the words that mean, the meaning of Seth is brought forth there. It should have been translated not as a personal name, but as the action of the name. Verse 18, continuing. And Edom, now who is Edom? That's Russia. All right, that's Russia of today. Shall be a possession. Seir, the south country of it, also shall be a possession of his enemies, for his enemies. And Israel shall do valiantly. As the ten tribes would scatter north over the Caucasus Mountains, would later settle Great Britain, um, the Americas, Canada. As the people of those ten tribes would scatter, ultimately in the latter days it would come to the point where basically they would be the superpowers of the end times, the latter days. It's come to pass, my friend. Come to pass, but don't go to sleep. Verse 19, out of Jacob, in other words, out of that lineage, out of that birthright, shall come he that shall have dominion, that is to say Christ himself, and shall destroy him that remaineth of the city. In other words, God himself, as we learn in that great prophecy of Zechariah, sends the horsemen north and when they have finished their work into, and into the north country, then God himself is at peace. Uh, verse 20. And when he looked on Amalek, he took up his parable and said, Amalek was the first of the nations, but his latter end shall be that he perish forever. This is not to say that, in other words, he must, he must uh, convert his way of thinking to the Lord, such as the tares, all right? If they, be, they are the children of Satan or the, or the sons of Cain until they accept Christ and then they become sons of God just like anyone else, all right? Understand, God has compassion. God has love for all his children that will follow him. But you can't be an atheist and act as an atheist to work against God and have him bless you. It just will not fly. It won't happen, all right? But once that atheist is converted to, let's say, Christianity, let there be no doubt, the blessings begin to flow for that one, okay? Verse 21, again, a vision concerning this generation. And he looked on the Kenites. It's important that you know the word Kenite. Many times I've taught it to you it means the sons of Cain when it is fully translated, just as Seth means confusion or tumult or concession, so does the Kenite simply, it's a race of people, it's the sons of Cain, all right? They were already in 1 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 55, keeping books for our brother Judah. Is it no wonder that Judah gets things a little confused at times? He looked on the Kenites, the sons of Cain, and he took up his parable and said, Strong is thy dwelling place, and thou puttest thy nest in a rock. Now, God 
I, I know God has a sense of humor, and, and it's impossible without going into the Hebrew a little bit to catch the play on words. Do you know what the word nest, in other words, they're playing on the word Kenite itself to make a, a, a super impression upon you about the sons of Cain whereby you are on guard as you are warned to be throughout the word of God. But the word kin, K-E-N, only um, it's uh, with the quaff being, uh, let's say, K. Actually, it is spelled K-A-N-E, Cain. But that's what a nest is, all right, in the Hebrew tongue. I'll, I'll, for the English ear, I will simply say, that key knight, sons of Cain, that key or kin is a nest. And God is, he's got a little riddle, a uh, parable going there for you to know that wherever the Kenite goes, he's going to have his own little nest, all feathered and secured. All right? But he says, I'll fix it. I'll take care of it. All right? And, um, and of course, um, I think we'll leave that there. Nevertheless, verse 22, did we just do that? I want to, I want to go with it, okay. Nevertheless, the Kenite, that's the sons of Cain, shall be wasted until Asher, that's the Assyrian, which is to say the false Messiah to you, as reiterated by uh, Isaiah in his 14th chapter, you with companion Bibles, it will be made real easy for you. Until Asher shall carry thee away captive. That means take you into captivity that the Kenite would be there until the false Messiah would take everyone into captivity and then they're going to be done away with. Why? Well, done away with. Why? Because they're either going to become sons of God or they're going to be destroyed. In other words, concerning the tares, at the end of the millennium, the angels gather the tares and throw them into the fire. What fire? The lake of fire. They have they, the negative part of God's plan, which is always ultimately positive, has run its course. Those that have accepted salvation have accepted it, so there's no need for time to go on, and God cuts it off right there. There is an end. And those scriptures have to do with the vision showing a man uh, approximately 1,400 years before Christ would walk the earth. And as it's written, it comes to pass exactly as it did for that root of Jesse, which is to say out of Jacob, did come forth. He was Messiah. And he is coming forth again as king of kings, ruling with a rod of iron, not, not to come back and baby people, but coming back with his shepherd's staff being a rod of iron that will flat get your attention if you start heading off in another direction while he's teaching. You won't have to worry about he getting your attention. So that time is coming, but there will be much deception according to these um, uh, prophecies, forecast. The latter times, the latter days, those times that are yet future, those times that many of the prophecies are yet future, but they shall come to pass, why? How many times did the chief teacher of all teachers say, haven't you read? It's written. In other words, it's written in God's word, the example set forth, why can you not see? All right, so there we have a prophecy concerning the end times, that in part, some of this is already coming to pass. Edom today is not a superpower, but it's a dangerous... Hey, a bear hibernates in the wintertime, and he doesn't give anybody too much trouble while he's asleep. I assure you that Russia is only hibernating as long as the red buttons... Now, we only had one before that could push it to bring destruction against Europe and the rest of the nations. Today there are about 12 of them. That means you got 12 more, you got 11 more buttons to worry about. You might say, quite frankly, that uh, that's uh, one for each of the dukes of Edom. That's what I said. 
And that's very biblical. One for each of the dukes of Edom or Russia. Okay, so there you have an example. That's how you study God's Word. Those terms and the terminology that means a great deal more than is actually written. I, I appreciate the fact that the word Seth was used as a name here, giving me as a teacher the opportunity to show you that you must be very careful when you study God's Word. When you know that all the children, uh, destroy all the children of Seth, uh, a great deal of Israel came through Seth. And God has written in another place that all Israel would be saved. So what do we got going here? Something's wrong. So therefore, you are able to pick up on that and correct it. In other words, learn to think for yourself. All right? Don't listen to this man 100% or any other man without checking out the scriptures. All right? You, you have the ability to think. Always do your own thinking. Do not let another individual do your thinking for you for a very simple reason. You are going to be judged on your own personal merits. It's written in a book. It's there. If you accomplished a lot of bad things because you listened to somebody else, even whether they were intentional or not, most likely they weren't. You would be innocent in it. You're still going to pay, sweetheart, because you listened to a nut Instead of checking him out in the Word of God, you are responsible for your own actions. I can say at the same time, in ignorance there is no sin. Well, the millennium will take care of that, and that's why we have the millennium. All right, let's go on to Jeremiah, one of the great prophets of all time. And let's see what he has to say about this concerning the latter days. Let's go to Jeremiah, oh, make it uh, chapter 23. Latter days, it's interesting and it's fun studying God's Word. Never just pop open the Bible and start reading somewhere. Get you a subject. If nothing else, an, uh, an example of how to make a, a nice study is if we were to say the latter rain and the latter days, which we've done in the last two lectures, go to your Strong's Concordance and it has every place in the Bible that the word latter is used. And I would have you not forget that latter, if you take it to the prime, means it's time to gather the crop, but also it tells you how to make sure you've got a crop together, spiritually speaking, from, from our Father's heart and mind. I mentioned in the last lecture about a farmer, and how have you never seen one? I asked the question, walk out in his field and reach down and get a handful of soil or take his toe and kick into the soil to check the depth of the moisture, how much moisture was there. Well, you, all those things are analogies for you. Do you do that in your spiritual life? Do you ever go out and check how much depth you really have in your knowledge tank? Hmm? To see how your fruit is maturing or how you're maturing in this end generation? Do you know what's happening in this world? It's written. You'd better know what's going on in this world. And it's quite easy to understand it from the Word of God. So you need to get off to yourself occasionally, walk out in your, the field of your mind, kick the dust a little bit and reach down and see what the moisture content is. To know whether you have enough in your tank, a knowledge tank, to uh, come to maturity or not. Think about it. All these things in the natural sense gives one a great amount of wisdom from God's own creation by gathering from that, as he would say, that's an example to you. That's an example. That is a way for you to gain knowledge. All right, we're going to go to the 19th verse uh, here. God, again, we're in Jeremiah. The king of Babylon was coming. And you had a bunch of preachers that were running around telling the people, though God had already told Jeremiah, you're going in captivity for 70 years, period. They're running around saying, it's not going to happen. God, I had a vision from God. I spoke to God this morning and God said, and I answered and God said. All right. 
God doesn't like that. God doesn't like that at all. Verse 19. Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord is gone forth in fury. Even a grievous whirlwind. A whirlwind in this is a whirling object, quite frankly. It shall fall grievously upon the head of the wicked. In other words, the lawless ones. It is coming, my friend. Well, when will that happen? The wicked seem to get away with everything. Hey, stick around, friend. It's, the, it's just beginning. The fun is just starting. It's especially starting for the Christians that have knowledge to know what's going on. Uh, this great destruction that, of God's fury, who did it say it was going to fall on? You sure can't use the just and the unjust here. All right? That's the point I want you to be sure and grasp from this. God's wrath, he's not angry at those he loves. He's only angry at the wicked ones. That's what it's addressing. Verse 20, the anger of the Lord shall not return until we have executed, until we have performed the thoughts of his heart. That's to say what's in his mind to complete the latter days. In the latter days, you shall consider it perfectly. You'd better know what it is perfectly, and you'd better understand it perfectly, because understanding is what he's talking about. Now listen to the vision, and listen to why. Ask yourself the question, why is God angry? Who does he consider to be the wicked? I sure don't want to be over in that stack. All right, well, listen and learn. Verse 21. I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. Oh, they were anxious to get in the pulpit and preach. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. Well, I talked to God today, and he told me to park my car over in this parking lot instead of that one. <laughs> Only an idiot makes a statement like that. These people and preachers and evangelists that play one-upmanship on each other, I tell you when God speaks, it is an astounding, sobering thing. It's not as though you carry on a, a conversation with him in ignorance. It's only done by them to try to impress each other and their people as who has the closest walk with God and God doesn't like it, God's angry, and boy, are they going to catch it. I, I'm, I'm going to sit back and applaud when that time comes. Verse 22. But if they had stood in my counsel, it's so easy. What's his counsel? This word. And had caused my people to hear my words. That's their job is to teach the word of God, not blow hot air for an hour. All right? Teach my words, my counsel. Then they should have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. They wouldn't have worshipped the Antichrist if they had heard the true word of God. Verse 23, Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? Why, well, he's not coming. He's not here now. Hey, he's not that far away, my friend. He can still get his hand into your little old uh, belt to give you a good shaking anytime he so chooses. 24, can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Now think about that. I'm going to hide something from God. I would go in and confess, but I don't want God to know it yet. Don't be stupid. God knows everything. You're not breaking any news to him. He already knows, saith the Lord. Do not I feel heaven and earth, saith the Lord, if, am I not the one that created the heaven and the earth and you're going to try to hide from me? I give a very stern warning to those that use the terminology before lay persons who do not understand what you're talking about when you get an unction from God saying you talk to him as though it's some frivolous thing that happens all the time. In other words, that, understand, now you're wise enough and a word of the wise is sufficient. I know the Holy Spirit was, is with us every moment of the day, but do not report it to the lay people who will think you're nuts 
If you say he talked to you, in the English language, that means he verbally spoke to you. Can he do that if he chooses? Yes, of course. But I don't care who it is, he's not going to talk verbally to somebody every day. Does he talk verbally? I, for one, can testify that he does. Be very careful, my friends, of the clergy and those that do liturgical duties such as deaconships, elders. We're living in a time when the day of accounting is very soon. Sober up. If God didn't send you, don't claim it, friend. Verse 25, I have heard what the prophets said. They prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. Verse 26, how long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart, their own grandeur, their own ego trip. Wake up, friend. Judgment starts here with the teachers, with those servants that perform liturgical duty. You'd better analyze carefully. I would rather than mislead someone and this is my prayer always, rather than mislead someone, I would rather that my ministry was totally and completely stripped. You have these little anti-Christian research groups that bring out this anti-Christian information and try to mix a good teacher in with a bunch of, of um, hate mongers that do not have the credentials on staff to, of anyone that even understands the language or is a linguist. God looks upon them. God knows. And we're in that moment. God takes care of his own. And for that reason, I'm glad that this ministry, with much prayer and many hours of research before something is taught, that it can be said boldly, this is from God. Wake up, you're in that generation. All right. Only on their ego trips. Verse 27. Which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams which they tell every man to his neighbor as their fathers have forgotten my name in Baal. Unfortunately, when the Spirit Messiah comes along, that's the name they remember, the flyaway Jesus. That happens to be the one Baal was trying to run and give money. Get ready, friend. It's interesting, and it's going to be very, it's going to be, very, it's, it's going to be heartbreaking in a sense, but at the same time, as time goes on, I can't help being a little amused by it. Verse 28, the prophet that hath a dream, let him tell a dream. Go ahead. And he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully from this Bible. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? In other words, what, you got the good golden fruit that brings forth fruit, and then you got a bunch of junk waste. What is he saying? Oh, listen. 29. Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? That's the false rock. You can break the fault. We don't have to be afraid of it. Our rock is Christ. Their rock is Satan. We have a hammer that can put Satan on the road just any time we choose. Come on, boy. Come on. We can handle you. But you're going to get hurt if you come. Anything demonic. Now, that's a little spiritual sidestep there, but be that as it may. I am proud that we can boldly make that statement that Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 10 verse 18 gave us authority over he that fell spiritually. Verse 30, Therefore behold I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that steal my words every one from his neighbor. You know what I heard? God spoke to me today. He did. Well, he spoke to me too. Verse 31, It's a game, my friends. Don't fall for it. I judge no man, but I know my father and you do too. He doesn't play around with nuts. All right, verse 31. 
Behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that use their tongues and say, He saith. I don't like it when they say, I said this or that and I didn't. 32. Behold, um, I am against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them and cause my people to err by their lies and by their lightness. They pay, it's all so light. Oh, God spoke to me and I said back to him, Yet I sent them not, nor commanded them. Therefore they shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord. Verse 33, continuing. And when this people, now listen to me, this gets pretty real serious, friend. And when this people, or the prophet, or the priest, shall ask thee, saying, What is the burden of the Lord? Thou shalt say unto them, What burden? I will even forsake you, saith the Lord. I, I want to I tell you for sure what this says, so you know. What kind of burden has God put on us today? I got some news for you. God never puts a burden on anybody. They ask for it. And if you want to get our fa my father angry at you, you just go ahead and ask what burden he has sent. He sent the Lord Jesus Christ to die for us on the cross where that we have everything so easy that it's like a rose garden in a sense that all we have to do is repent. He died for us. We don't have to die. He took the burden, not us. He took the stripes. We get the healing. And then some idiot comes along and asks, well, what grievous thing has God put on us? It's such a burden serving God. God will smash you for that. It's an insult to Him after all the good. Hey, if you want to get in trouble with our Father, just ask that question. It makes Him angry quick. All right? You won't have to wait till the judgment to, to, to feel His, um, his uh, hand. Verse 34. And as for the prophet... And the priest and the people that shall say, The burden of the Lord, I will you even punish that man in his house. You better not even teach that God puts a burden on people when he has eased our load with the yoke. It's easy, it's light. He carries the load. He carries the burden. Don't you ever dare accuse my father of putting a burden on anyone. It's an insult or any preacher that will tell you that he put a burden on. He's a liar coming out the gate. Verse 35, Thus shall you say every one to his neighbor and every one to his brother, What hath the Lord answered? <laughs> That's a good question. And what hath the Lord spoken? 36, And the burden of the Lord shall you mention no more. Don't you even talk about it. For every man's word shall be his burden. Whatever you say, hey, you can count on it, friend. If you say, God put this upon me, you're going to get it all right. You just spoke the prophecy from your own mouth. God is going to double it to your account. You're going to have trouble like you've never seen before. You're going to think your little world came apart. For ye have perverted the words of the living God of the Lord of hosts our God. You can count on it, friend, and you don't have to wait till the hereafter to find proof of it. Some of you can probably call something to mind at some time in your life. You might say, I wonder why God makes this so hard for me. And it got twice as bad, didn't it? Well, it will again until you learn your lesson. God loves his children. And some prophet or preacher or so-called man of God that tells you. That's what Job's problem was. He listened to those three nuts for 37 up to the 38th chapter of God must have done this to you and put that burden and that burden. And finally God in the 38th chapter said to Job, why do you listen to those idiots that have absolutely no wisdom in their mind? And some people will even preach sermons on what those idiots taught in Job. Well, we're calling a lot of names. Well, hey, God calls them names too. He doesn't like them. He calls them liars and troublemakers and pretenders, ego trippers, 
well, I'm just teaching God's Word. That's why he feels about it. Friend, if you want trouble in your life, especially in these latter days, just, just don't ask what burden has God sent today. He hasn't sent any. Man brings it on himself. God, with the yoke of Christ, alleviates the weight from us. We got it made. We got it so easy. If you listen to God's counsel in these latter days and take advantage of the blessings that he brings into our life. Well, there you got it. It's the latter days. It will happen in the latter days. <laughs> you want to document that? Turn your television on next week. And listen around to what this one says or that one says. Check it out, friend, or make two or three little trips down in your local community. Check it out and see what men are saying and what the so-called flyaway doctors are teaching. Enjoy. But be wise by taking counsel from God's Word and not chaff. Because there's a lot of chaff floating around and it's going to get singed in the fire with all other lies. See that you're not a part of it. I want to go one more place. I want to go to Timothy. We ended the last lecture with the New Testament. I, w I choose to do it again. I want to go to 1 Timothy. I want to go to chapter 4. We refer to this chapter quite a bit because of people mentioning the food laws. I want to show you that the latter days are mentioned also in Timothy. It is important when you read that you pay attention to what you read. Many people can read and when they have read it, I don't know, maybe it's a pretty good struggle for their mind simply to use the art of reading to decipher each word without putting an entire string of words in context to, to, to decipher their meaning, their subject, their object. And therefore, they don't know anything after they've read it because they didn't think. Do your own thinking and don't let man think for you. I do not want you to get the impression that I'm trying to say that I know everything. I don't, but I know somebody that does. It's my father. He knows everything. And when you do your utmost to listen to him, this word becomes pregnant and it grows and produces fruit in your mind, all right? We're just getting started, but we're beginning to see the truth and the veil and what's behind it. Chapter 4, verse 1, 1 Timothy. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, and in the latter times, that's the same as the latter days, those years that consummate the end of this age, shall some depart from the faith. What's that? The doctrine that Christ taught, and even in the Old Testament, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, the false Messiah himself, quite frankly. Two, speaking lies in hypocrisy, claiming to be very religious, yes, Follow this and you'll be saved. I'll tell you, there are a lot of people listening to salvation messages around the world today and you're not going to end up in the salvation bin, my friend, if you're not very careful. Christ does the saving. You better, you better find out which, which uh, white horse you've got your buggy hooked to, friend. Now that, that's a little word of wisdom within itself from the book of Revelation. There are a lot of people who think they have their buggy hooked to the white horse it should be, and it isn't. I promise you. Why? Because people are not teaching the Word of God, but the, but the traditions of men. That's why. Concerning our gathering back to Christ, Christ made it very clear through the teachings of Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, don't forget it. Having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Boy, I'm telling you what, Satan, when he teaches a lie, he can sear that mind over. And if the majority says it and thinks it, how could some individual that was a scholar of God's word know the difference? In other words, you're not going to, when something is seared over, uh, what does it do? 
And it uh, seems I made a tape on that. I'm sure I did one time about branded. When you're branded or when you're burned real bad, that particular skin and tissue area, the nerves are dead. You don't feel anything. Well, their foreheads are seared over and you can't teach them anything either. Verse 3, forbidden to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. Now, now wake up. Listen to what God said through this one. To abstain from meats. I mean, that's hypocrisy for someone to tell you, abstain from meats, which God hath created. Well, boy, there, now God made it, made all food. He created every animal, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Well, it's all good to eat then, isn't it? No, you haven't finished reading the sentence. I'm trying to help you think. I'm not being smart. I'm not being ludicrous, okay? I'm trying to show you how you must think as you read. Which God hath created to be. There's a qualifier. To be received. How many animals did God create to be received? Well, read Leviticus 15. That's what he's talking about. Open season on those, but he still didn't clear you to eat filth. All right? That's one of the greatest damnable lies taught in the world today, and that's one reason why you have so many medical bills throughout the world, is people have been told and taught by certain would-be priests, but I don't, they're priests of Baal, I suppose, because they can't read or something, to understand that if you eat, if you eat uh, uh, bloodsuckers, that is to say, scavengers that God created to, as vacuum cleaners to keep this, the filth away from this world. If you cut one of those little old beauties out and eat the fat off of it, you're eating nothing but pure poison and, and, and you're going to die. You're going to be sick. You're going to be diseased. You can count on it. That's why, that's why God brought the health laws forward. With thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Oh, yes, there it is. As long as we say thanks over it, it's all right. Yeah, but you left out the thought, the main point, all right? Now, verse 4, For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused. It is if it be received with thanksgiving. That is to say, those he created to be received. The other creatures are good. That's why he created them, to do their job. It wasn't to fill your dinner table. 5, For it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. All right, verse 6, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourishing up in the word of faith and good doctrine, whereunto thou hast obtained. All right, and for bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness, this being the eighth verse, is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. In other words, you expand your life, long life here, yeah, but a long life also in the eternity. So take care of your body and your spiritual body. Hey, the latter days, isn't that exciting? Studying our Father's Word, it's really interesting. Hope you enjoyed it. All right, bless your hearts. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. All right. Bless your hearts. Sorry, we are back again. Hey, let's have a look at the 800 number, 1-800-643-4645. That number good from Puerto Rico throughout the U.S., including Canada, way up to the North Country. And those of you by shortwave around the world, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. It's always good to hear from you. 
And you got a prayer request, talk to him. He's your father. Father, we come to you. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, touch, heal. In Yeshua's precious name. Let's get right to our questions here. Bill from New Jersey. I have a question. First, would Nebuchadnezzar possibly be translated false prophet king? I use my strongs and this is what I got, but it is, it is hard to do. Well, you, uh, in as much as um, Nebo means prophet or it can mean prophet, the proper translation for all of it is, uh, is um, God uh, protect the crown, all right, or Nebo rather protect the crown, which is to say prophet protect the crown. You, you did pretty good, did pretty good. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22, it states that God sits upon the circle of the earth, world, earth. Would this point to the earth uh, being round or just a figure of speech? No, uh, I did a study on that not too long ago. I think I called it Don't Kick Against the Pricks. I think that was the title of the tape. And the um, prick is the prick of a compass in one sense, that is the center always of a circle, even the circle of the world. And that's the circle it's talking about. It's quite a deep study. You might enjoy that tape. Emmanuel from California. When my father was dying, he said my mother came to visit him. She had been gone for 15 years. Is this possible? Certainly it is. God usually for a, sends someone to help someone walk that shadow of death that they trust the most, a loved one. I have, a, being a pastor, uh, that's one thing that a pastor spends a lot of time with and, and around and near is death, all right? And counseling families and so on and so forth. I've experienced this more than one time. Charlene from California, is it a sin to be cremated? No, no. When we are through with the flesh, the spirit body, which is your actual body and soul, immediately goes back to the Father that gave it. It doesn't matter what happens to the dust. Uh, Sharlita from Colorado. What does the Bible say about consulting astrologers and soothsayers? Well, probably one of the best things you would do is go to the 21st chapter of the um, book of Revelation, and you would find there that all soothsayers and... Um, Astrologers, usually called a wizard, such as in Daniel, are going to be destroyed. They're not going to be there. So I would be very cautious about going to one. You might join them in their little travel. Now, that does not have anything to do with, with your walk with God's creation. That is to say, the Bible and the stars and so forth. All right, got it. Connie from California were Great Britain and America formed by the lost tribes, and are they Israel? Well, they, there, there really are no lost tribes. The people forgot who they were, but God didn't lose anybody, okay? But they are the ten northern tribes. I would rather use that terminology. Yes, they are, all right? And many times they were referred to prophetically as Ephraim and Manasseh of the end times. Okay, a friend of mine, this is, who is this? This is Daniel from California. A friend of mine says he does not like the biblical story of Genesis because of the leash God put on Adam and Eve. What he meant was that he thought knowledge was a good thing. In other words, to be able to discern good and evil is to grow up as children. This friend thought that if God existed, it would limit his horizons as a result. Well, hey... He's, he's a little bit dense up here, all right, because that isn't what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is, if you have any depth at all. What, it, the, what is the prime root of the word tree in the Hebrew tongue? It's, it's atash, which is to say your backbone with the central nervous system. And God gave many instructions uh, in that word. Uh, for example, if you listen to God's instructions, you never have to worry about getting AIDS. You never have to worry about um, uh, being murdered necessarily if you use common sense. And there are many things to know and discern good and evil, but what he was talking about was to be seduced wholly by Satan, as it is written in 
2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse um, uh, 3. And to document that, what was, it? read the 16th verse of the third chapter and see what the results of Eve partaking of the tree meant. All right? Use a little depth. Your friend in his present condition is not going to make it. All right? Uh, he, of course, he sounds like an intellectual, and that's, that's uh, maybe, who knows, maybe he'll get smart along with it, Bible smart, and grow up a little bit. Okay, Margie from Alabama, document God making the earth wax old. Key answer to archaeologists determining age of the earth. Hey, Margie, you're talking to the wrong man. God made this earth millions and millions of years ago. The archaeologists and science are exactly correct in the age of this earth, why God's Word states it is. You've got a few of these Bible thumpers that do not understand the original languages. Therefore, they'll say this earth is only 6,000 years old, so they've got to dream up some fairy tale that God aged everything in, in one day. That's a bunch of malarkey and don't pay any attention to it, all right? The earth is millions and millions of years old and the Bible declares it. Hey, I'm out of time. Just out here winning friends and influencing people today, especially ministers and teachers that um, do not adhere strictly to our Father's Word. Hey, that's the way we learn. We teach and we look at God's counsel, not the counsel of man. I love you all because you enjoy studying more in depth. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If you wish us to continue coming to you, then we thank you and we enjoy being there for the fellowship with the presence of the Holy Spirit is a wonderful thing. Now, most important, stay in His Word. Every day in it is a good day. Do you know why? Yeshua Jesus is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.